We're good. All right. Well, we're back for episode two of our Revelation study that I have titled uh, The Days of Vengeance, A Covenant Judgment. And um, I actually got out my old uh, Days of Vengeance book and I yeah, read buddy. that part you know, for the first few verses. And he says that he says it's a covenant judgment. So uh, that, that would be in agreement with so far what we heard last week. Um, we do not have Joel Rosenauer this week. He unfortunately got sick and uh, wasn't able to join us. So hopefully he'll get to feeling better, feel better, Joel. And then uh, he'll be back next week. So there's Travis and Zach. Hey, guys. What's up, Rick? How y'all doing? And Mike? We're good. <laughs> good. So, Mike, um, before we get into this, uh, you had said that there were some things that you would like to just bring up to us before we get into chapter one. So take it away, sir. Yeah. Uh, we're usually accused, falsely accused, I believe, as being unorthodox. And this is especially coming from our Reformed brethren, Sovereign Grace brethren. And they say, hey, look, uh, you guys aren't honoring the creeds. You're not honoring the confessions. Therefore, what was that? Uh, that one uh, YouTube channel, I think, uh, just kind of banned full preterists from making any comments. Uh, I think eschatology exactly matters. What is it called? Eschatology matters. Unless, yeah. unless you're uh, talking preterist. about eschatology, <laughs> then. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what I wanted to do is just kind of cite what the Westminster Confession of Faith states and show you how we're actually more reformed than these guys are. So let me just add this up here. This is what the Westminster Confession of Faith states. The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is Scripture itself. That's the analogy of faith. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. Let me stop there. So now we're in the book of Revelation. What speaks more clearly? Well, to the all-millennialist, he looks at the book of Revelation says, book of Revelation and says, this is talking about the second coming of Christ. And there's complete rec uh, recapitulation between the end of the millennium events with the rest of the book. In other words, it's one judgment and it takes place at the second coming of Christ. We agree with that. So they're looking at it. This is the easiest way. We're, we're going to go with the simplest approach first. But the partial predators looks at it and says, wait a second, the more clear passages to me are the time text and the apocalyptic language. Therefore, the book of Revelation was written before AD 70. Christ coming upon the clouds is referring to apocalyptic language. And the time text means that it was fulfilled in AD 70. All right. And so they're like just two rams, budding horns constantly, where we come along and we say, we believe that the more clear that you're both teaching actually forms our position. We're going to embrace both. It is the second coming and it was fulfilled in 8070. Okay. So it goes on the Supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees or councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined. And in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the scripture, all synods or councils since the apostles times, whether general or particular may err and many have erred. Therefore they are not to be made the rule of faith or practice, but to be used as a help in both. So the three of us, the four of us come along and say, Hey, late, look, we're just following the reformed views on the book of Revelation. And in fact, as we go through Revelation, we'll probably be looking at this, all right? Steve Gregg's where he's where he's harmonizing a lot of different views on Revelation. And we're, as we go through, we're gonna show you how our view of Revelation is perfectly orthodox. It's straight and it's consistent. But notice that it says that the creeds in the past have erred and that the one that they are forming right then and there, the Westminster Confession of Faith, may be an error and is subject to change just like other ones. So guys, just real quick on, on this alone, um, are we not reformed in challenging the creeds and saying, hey guys, we need to listen to what both of you guys are saying and kind of be that reformed and always reforming concept? Yeah, I mean, I would say so. And I've asked the question many times, Mike, is 
um, once this is brought up, how do you open the books? How do how do we you know with the Westminster Confession there there were the what were they called the the the, the divines or something whoever yeah. they were right yeah. the ones that came in and they made these decisions all we're asking is hey we've seen this we want to bring this up let's let's analyze this you know instead of shutting us down right to me it seems like they kind of dismiss that last line there uh, yes, and more or less any passage any interpretation whatever that the creedalist takes they're presupposing the creed before they even look at the text, right? Which is kind of backwards of what the creed itself says we're supposed to do. Um, Scripture is the supreme authority, but they're viewing it as these guardrails or this box or whatever that you must first be in to even approach the scriptures. And I just think that's so Which was the Roman Catholic view. You had to be in their box. And that's why they said, Luther, you're outside of our box if you're teaching this forensic justification because we can't find it in our box of the church fathers. Mm -hmm. So if the reformed people can get out of that box, right, and reform, why can't we? Especially when all we're doing is combining their their two orthodox views. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of pastors in Arkansas who are releasing a thing on unorthodox eschatology this week, and uh, I'm sure this is where this is going to start. So... Okay, I, we'll, well, good. we'll see how unorthodox we are by the time it's over with. I can't wait to hear it and me and Travis to respond. Does so. does the London Baptist Confession say the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. It's yeah. very, very slightly that? modified, the, the London Baptist 1689. Okay, so I kind of already mentioned this, but let's <laughs> go over it. The classic all-millennial view would teach the coming of Christ throughout the book of Revelation is the one second coming event that ends the millennium of Revelation 20 and brings about the judgment and resurrection of the living and the dead. Do we agree with that, guys? Uh, I would we say for classic. 100% with that orthodox view, correct? W- yes, with classic amillennialism, but I've met some amillennialists that believe in a third coming, and they say so, which that's is why, rare. That's yeah. why I put classical. I appreciate that. Yep. Okay. Postmillennial partial preterism. But the coming of Christ in Revelation was spiritually fulfilled soon, or shortly in AD 70, at which time there was a corporate resurrection in AD 70. And of course, Jordan and others say souls and spirits were raised out of Hades into God's presence in AD 70. Do we agree with this orthodox view? Yes. Okay. Yes. So if we combine the two orthodox views, how do we get an unorthodox view? Is there any other area of theology where you can hold to two orthodox views of the church and somehow become or- unorthodox? I'm not aware of one. If if someone can give me an example out there, please do. Therefore, the soon or shortly spiritual second coming of Christ throughout the book of Revelation ended the millennium of Revelation 20. This is real basic stuff, guys. And again, the recapitulation, the millennial says Revelation 20 is not an island unto itself. The judgment scene that we see in chapters 1 through 19 and 21 and 22, that's the same judgment as the end of the millennium. But yet our partial preterist friends tell us chapters 1 through 19 and chapters 21 and 22 were fulfilled in AD 70. Again, when you combine those two orthodox views and you honor the recapitulation structure and the one judgment that was in AD 70, you get full preterism. Mm-hmm. Now, last week we, um, was it Joel? I think Joel brought up, or no, I brought up the silence and then and then he mentioned John A.T. Robinson. Let's read what he had to say. This guy was a liberal who usually date all the, the New Testament documents post AD 70, but this is what he said. One of the oddest facts about the New Testament is that what on any showing would appear to be the single most datable and climactic event of the period, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and with it, the collapse of institutional Judaism based on the temple is never once mentioned as a past fact. The silence is as as significant as the silence for Sherlock Holmes of the dog that did not bark. I like that last part. Mm -hmm. Again, the silence of of Jerusalem being trodden down. And then again, the Christians boasting, saying, see, we told you, Jesus said he was going to come. He came. The temple's destroyed. We are the true children of God, just like Jesus promised. 
that would have been something that every New Testament document would be just proclaiming from the rooftops if every if everything was written after, but we don't see that. Then real briefly, let's review this on the dating. Uh, I think this is something Joel brought up. Revelation 13, Revelation 17 talks about near, we talks about this beast figure. His name is a man, 666. And then we go to chapter 17. We learn that there are seven hills and that there, that these are symbolic of seven kings. And he says, five have fallen, Julius fallen, Augustus fallen, Tiberius fallen, Gaius fallen, Claudius fallen. But then he says, but the one that now is, that is one that is alive when John is writing, and that's Nero. Nero's name comes to 666. Now in Hebrew, if you're going from Greek to Hebrew, it's 666. And that's the majority text, the oldest ancient scripts, as uh, Irenaeus actually says. Now, there are some um, alternate manuscripts that render it 616, and that's because they're going from the Latin to the Hebrew. So that's fine, because this actually bolsters the view that Nero was 666, because it doesn't matter how you do it. If you do it from the Greek to the Hebrew, or you do it from the Latin to the Hebrew, Nero Caesar is the one there. And then it says that the seventh will reign but a little while. And look how long Galba reigned. He only reigned one year. Do any of you guys have anything else to say on this? Because it is a pretty important part as far as dating the book of Revelation. No, I don't. The only thing that I've seen uh, that may be a little different is I, I saw, I believe it was Adam Marshall wrote something yeah. once. We'll, we'll get into that eventually. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, I'll just wait and we can bring that up later. It was just yeah. in regard to it being the seven hills were also the seven hills of Israel or of Jerusalem. Every every uh, Jewish boy would know that he would have to memorize the seven hills or the se seven mountains surrounding Jerusalem as well. And, you know, I've gone back and forth, you know, over the years. Is the beast a combination of Rome and the, the Roman beast would be the sea beast and the land beast? would be the Jewish beast, apostate mm -hmm. Israel. Um, but this right here, because some of these guys like Adam want to say the beast is purely Jewish. Mm -hmm. This to me, I just don't see you getting around this. To me, this is the clearest indicator that Nero was was the uh, 666 figure. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I cannot get around it. And there are other pro exegetical problems I see as making the beast purely Jewish and not have Rome involved at all. And okay. we'll discuss that. We'll, we'll look at the pros and cons of both. Yeah, I was just this. bringing up that that's the only other thing that I've seen in regard yeah. to that. Exactly. Do, do any of you other guys want to add anything on that? No. no, I'm glad he brought that up as far as that goes, because I hear that a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd probably just point you back to Daniel, too, when you've got it mixed together. So yeah. you come up with yeah. the same idea. Exactly. The, the iron being Rome and the mm -hmm. clay being uh, the Jews or the Herodian dynasty, I think. is yeah, That's Jordan a great point. point. Very good. I mean, point. you're going to because you're going to have to. And, and then and I'm sure Adam's got answers. I hadn't heard all this stuff, but, you know, you're going to get into the way that Gentiles are used and the way that C is represented by Gentiles all over the place. And that the distinction that's there, because these whoever this is, is outside of the covenant land. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. Even if you try to make it Herod and the Herodian dynasty or the pre or whatever, I mean, you've got people outside of the covenant land. So I'm, that is something I remember calling Mike on the phone one day and, and us talking about that specifically. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, when you get into Luke 21, which we're going to get into here shortly, you know, because Revelation is just John's version of the Olivet Discourse, you've got the Gentile nations trotting down Jerusalem for the times of the Gentiles. That's not the times of the 10 Northern tribes, you know, mm -hmm. so you, you've got to see Rome in here somewhere. And uh, I, I definitely see Rome in here as the, uh, the sea beast. And uh, Gary DeMar has said just kind of what I just said. John's version of the Olivet Discourse is the book of Revelation. Gentry says it is an interesting fact noted by a number of commentators that John's gospel is the only gospel that does not contain the Olivet Discourse. And that it would seem John's revelation served 
as his exposition of the discourse. I've got a question here, guys. Is there an inconsistency here with, with Gentry? Je doesn't Gentry see two comings of Christ in uh, in the Olivet Discourse? He does. Yeah. How many comings of Christ does he see in the book of Revelation? I, I haven't Let studied Gentry that one. much. One. There's, there's only yeah. one coming of Christ throughout the book of Revelation, and he says it was fulfilled in 8070. Would he not say that in 20 he's got another one at the end? But where is it? Well, I mean, I get that, but right, right. So what he has to do is he has to import it from First Corinthians 15, First Thessalonians 4. He can't prove it within the document itself. Which so is you think, point. Mike, if you could prove that First Corinthians 15 was the same as the Olivet Discourse, that he would have trouble with that? Oh yeah, and of course that's easy to do. Um, okay, so Zach did a really good job last time of pointing out. When we're, when we're looking at the structure of Revelation, that this is a covenantal lawsuit. And I think we had mentioned, I don't know if we mentioned, um, that there are all these parallels between the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation. So let's let's go over some of them. Uh, Jesus, of course, predicts that there would be times of wars and rumors of wars, and wars had arrived, according to Revelation. Now, a lot of these are coming out of Revelation 6. You have the four horsemen, right? You've got death and you've got war and you've got pestilence and famine. And so that time had arrived in the book of Revelation. Number two, the time of famine had arrived. Again, Revelation 6, Deuteronomy 28. This is a part of the covenant curses. So we have the covenant curses in Matthew 24 and the covenant curses in Revelation, which speaks to a pre-AD 70 date because the old covenant is still binding upon that land and so these curses are still binding upon it this is not these are not covenant curses being brought upon the globe or the planet earth number four the time of the passing of heaven and earth or the metaphorical decreation of israel's old covenant world had come deuteronomy 32 22 talks about john lightfoot adam clark you know talks about um the fire burning the mountains Right. And if we just talked about how Israel was surrounded by these seven mountains and was on a mountain. So when he's talking about Israel at, at Israel's appointed end, she was going to be burned up. It's talking about the old covenant system and the land being burned there. And of course, we have all the decreation language and all of it discourse. And you guys jump in anytime you want. Mm -hmm. If OK, so we have the decreation in both. Five, the time of persecution blood guilt false prophets and deceptions had arrived just like deuteronomy 32 prophesied and these are found in revelation 16 through 18 and uh matthew 24 9 and 11 where they were going to be turned over even by their own family members would kill them and jesus is saying their blood would be crying out to him and he would come in vengeance in that generation and in Revelation, he would come soon and quickly to avenge the blood of the persecuted church. Number six, apostasy was taking place. Number seven, the time for the great tribulation was present and about to increase. Remember, John says that he is in the tribulation with the seven churches. Now, let's talk about that briefly, because primarily, primarily in the Olivet Discourse, the tribulation is talking about the wrath coming upon the land. But the tribulation spilled over into the Roman Empire and affected these seven churches in Asia Minor. OK, mm -hmm. so they were being persecuted. That's why in the early chapters of Revelation, we see the exhortation. You have to persevere. If you do, you will get such and such reward that we will find in the new creation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, number eight. And Mike, can I just yes. say that that also really does point to Nero because mm -hmm. of that specific time whenever after the great fire, this is when Nero, that's when the persecution begins, the neurotic persecution. So it did, it was beyond just, just the land uh, itself. It was kind of throughout the empire where anybody who was, you know, uh, of Jewish descent, something was happening to them at that time. So it was, to me, I, I think that points to Nero even more. And he, and Nero was married to a, a Jewish woman, wasn't he? And he oh, was, and he was surrounded by, uh, some other Jews that came to him. And I think that they probably were the ones 
that instigate instigated the whole concept of let's blame the Christians for what you've done by burning burning Rome. Yeah, um, there was a quote in um, it was Pete and Rachel Rue's first book, and I, I wish I had it in front of me. I didn't think about it, um, but there's I've a quote in there. There's a quote in there from somebody. I, I don't remember the historian, but he was talking about how. I think it was Nero's persecution was so widespread throughout the land that essentially they were everywhere, you know? Mm. So, so everybody was feeling it, which makes it's the point you're making right now. Mm. Yeah. So the tribulation spilled over for sure. The big question. <clears throat> Number nine, the time of the abomination desolation had arrived 10, the judgment of the great city. Of course, in the Olivet discourse, it's all about the wrath coming upon the land of the Jews, the Jer Jerusalem and the temple that they're looking at in revelation. It's all about the judgment of this great city where John clearly identifies as where the Lord was slain in chapter 11. Uh, that coincides, of course, perfectly with Revel or Daniel 12, uh, the shattering of the holy people. And then number 11, the flight and salvation of the faithful remnant. Uh, that is the elect took place. And then last, or well, close to last, 12, the coming of Christ upon the clouds to save, redeem, gather, and harvest the dead among Israel and, and Hades had arrived. 13, the judgment for breaking the old covenant law and committing the sin of blood guilt is the same concept in both. 14, the time of the great supper and the wedding takes place at the same time. And then lastly, the time frame is identical. Jesus says it was going to be near in his generation. And as that generation is ending, <clears throat> the book of Revelation says, okay, it's going to take place shortly soon and will not delay. So those are the parallels between the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation. One last thing, and then I'm going to be quiet for the rest of the show for the most part. <laughs> but, but whenever I teach on the Olivet Discourse, like I did at the conference, the Arkansas conference, or I teach on the book of Revelation, as I have in the past, what I like to do to lay a good foundation is to show people <clears throat> in the Old Testament, when God would come upon the clouds in judgment or there was a day of the Lord, not only is it apocalyptic language, and a lot of people do that. Joel did it at, did a great job at the conference. I like to find text that has apocalyptic language but has a time text connected to it because I like to show how the time texts were interpreted literally and the apocalyptic language symbolically. So when we get to the Olivet Discourse or we get to the book of Revelation, why does the why does the hermeneutic get reversed? It's good, right? Yeah. So in Ezekiel seven seven through nine, the time has come. The day is near. I will soon pour out my wrath. Then you will know that I am the Lord who strikes. John Gill points this out. Points out that this took place in three years. Okay, Ezekiel twelve. Let them therefore. Thus says the Lord God. I will put an end to this proverb. What's the proverb? The false prophets were saying, yeah, he, I know Ezekiel keeps saying that God's going to come near and soon to judge us. But really, he's referring to a judgment that's going to come in the lifetime of our children. So what was near, they were pushing as farther off. That's the proverb that God is going to silence. That's what's making him mad. Um, but say to them, the days are near and the fulfillment of every vision. It will no longer be delayed. Matthew Poole points out again, this was fulfilled in three years. And then Ezekiel 30 and 32, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds. Okay, he's coming on the clouds. When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord. Now we've got a time text. We got coming on the clouds and we have decreation language. Matthew Poole is the best I've found. He says this judgment began within three to five years, but extends no later than 16 to 18 years. All right. And it's it's the final fulfillment of Babylon judging Egypt and her allies. So when it talks about all nations, it's talking about the nations of the then known world, the, the allies of that time. Now, what about the um, symbolic language here of the decreation. This is what he says. He says, this is talking about the total ruin of the whole kingdom in which the best, greatest, and noblest parts are as heaven, suppose the government, the sun, the king, 
the moon, the queen, the stars, the princes and nobles, bright lights, the most eminent of the subjects for wisdom and understanding, and then the land, the common people, all shall be covered with clouds and darkness of misery, first and sorrow next. Is that not beautiful? Yeah. Now, why don't we interpret the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation just like this? Hmm. Sounds like Jeremiah 31 to me, that section of it. Yeah. I mean, what we've done, guys, is we've turned everything upside down. The church is now taking the time text and they're spiritualizing that when in the Old Testament they were literalized. And the decreation language, the church is now literalizing when in the Old Testament, it was figurative. Mm -hmm. We've just got to get back to letting the Bible interpret itself. And I could go on, Obadiah. Um, Oz I'm not going to do these. I, I think I think we've uh, we've covered the main ones. And my main point is, look, the time texts were always fulfilled literally in the Old Testament, and the decreation was symbolic language. Once we get into Revelation, there's no need to flip that upside down. Very good. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So with the last 34 minutes, 35 minutes that we have of this hour that we do, um, why don't we just roll right in to uh, Revelation uh, chapter one and the first three verses? What, what's the smile about? Is it because you're soon eight oh, minutes to 26? <laughs> Mike, I'm going to take eight to 10 minutes. Also, Mike, 26 I will, I minutes. I will be quiet. <laughs> No, it's okay. It's we just understand that you use soon, similar to the future. <laughs> this will be real quick, guys. <laughs> First oh, man. one is the hand, Rick. First one is the hand. <laughs> but <laughs> honestly, we just let's just tackle the first three verses. Um, and if it's okay, I don't know if anybody's. A, I don't know, if, Mike, if you're able to pull it up on the screen, or if anybody wants to just grab their Bible and read it ourselves, we can just read it. But I would like to read the first three verses in the King James version. Um, simply because it's something that David Chilton said, and I really liked it. So let's start with this. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 in the King James Version says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, before when I was a futurist, I don't know how I missed that much time. Like, I, I don't know how I missed it, but I just it's like I just read right over it. But the <clears throat> thing that really hit me right out of the gate is that word signified. If you read it in other languages, they put it as communicated. But signified, what Chilton says is signified. In other words, this is going to be a book of signs that the that the way that they're communicating Symbol. is through a book of signs. And to me, the thing that struck me, guys, when I and, and you got my notes, and so I'm just going to say it to the best of my ability. Right out of the gate, my brain starts working with how this revelation was given. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And so what I, the way that I put it is that my little brain begins to try to understand how the Godhead is working here. Now, I don't want to go down a big rabbit hole here, okay, because I'm obviously I'm Trinitarian. It's just something that popped into my head and it and I began to wonder if it was something of what was going on in Matthew 24. And I think Travis and Mike, you guys could probably help me here. Travis. In, in Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 36, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them uh, prior to verse 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. So that's kind of what stuck out in my head. I thought, is this the moment where the father is revealing it to the son? Do you guys have anything to say in regard to that? Take it away, Travis. Yes. Um, so I don't see this as being any different <clears throat> than anything else Jesus revealed 
in the New Testament. <clears throat> you look at Hebrews 1, excuse me, my throat's messed up apparently. But in Hebrews 1, you know, long ago he, he spoke through the prophets, yada, 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 verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, mm -hmm. whom he's appointed the heir of all things. <clears throat> so God speaks to the son who speaks to us, right? That's the chain that's normative. Um, and you see other texts like in John's gospel where he's essentially saying, I, I speak nothing other than what the father gave me. Mm -hmm. So I don't see an issue with that in Revelation. I, I don't see this as being an aha moment for him where he was given something that he didn't already have. Um, and maybe you disagree and that's fine. But as to um, Matthew 24, what you're talking about, when he's talking about that day and that hour and only the Father knows, so I think there's two different things he's pulling from going on there. The, the day and the hour thing, and you can, you can Google this and you'll find it. I mean, you can read about it. Um, but it was associated with the Feast of Trumpets. So the way this worked, you know, most of their feast days had a set calendar day. It, it followed the, the lunar cycle and it was the same time every year. Well, the Feast of Trumpets was not that way. It was dependent on the lunar cycle, and it didn't begin until the first sliver of the new moon came. Um, and that whatever day that occurred on, that would be considered the first day of Tishri. Okay, and they actually what they call it, Mike, the uh, the unknown day or the unexpected day or something like that. Yeah, they'd have and, three uh, three guys on <laughs> three different mountaintops with mm -hmm. with trumpets, yes. looking for the new moon, and that was the only day that that was like that. It, it was the unknown day, yeah. And so basically there was a Hebrew idiom that had developed in their day that, that no man knows the day or the hour, and it was directly associated with trumpets. Well, it's awfully ironic that in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, talking about his coming, which would first begin with the fulfillment of trumpets, that he's borrowing from, from that imagery. So mm -hmm. I think that's how we answer the one. And then on the other hand, he says, you know, no one knows, not even the son, but my father only. Well, this is Jewish wedding language. This is where this develops from. As you guys know, they would have a betrothal. Um, they would, I think they did a gift exchange. There was a drink thing. Like this was a very ceremonial deal in their day with the Jewish people. And then, you know, the woman would leave and she would take, um, was it called the mikvah? The, the ceremonial cleansing. Basically, she would go cleanse herself in anticipation for when her husband came to get her. But if anyone asked the husband during that time, when are you going to go get your bride? He would say, only my father knows. Mm. Basically, I don't know. The father's the one that has set the date. And he has the authority. <clears throat> he's the one with the authority. And if you look at, I mean, immediately after he says all that, he goes into the parable of the 10 virgins, talks about coming like a thief in the night. And if you look at all those parables that he's telling, I think the point of all of them is be ready. That's the point. Well, well, what did the Jewish wedding and the Feast of Trumpets have in common? You had to be ready because nobody knew when it was coming, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what he's getting at there. I don't think he's saying he didn't know. And what are, whether you want to say he laid aside this divine prerogative in his humanity, I don't think that's the point. I think the point is he's making the same point he's been making and will go on to make, which is I'm coming. You need to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And it also, and I'll, I'll tack this on to it makes no sense to me that he hammers the religious leaders and he says, this is going to happen in your generation. And then he goes through this laundry list of events they're going to see happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he says again, all these things will happen in this generation. So he knows all that stuff, but then we're going to turn around and say, but he doesn't know when this, when this is going to happen. That doesn't jive with me. That's a, that's a, I can't wrap my head around that. Mike, I know you're jumping to get in here. Yeah, I think that the church and the cults both have missed Matthew 24, 36. I don't think the point is that Jesus is saying he doesn't know something as far as his omniscience. I think it's a trigger in their mind to mm -hmm. go to the betrothal, to go to the Feast of Trumpets. That's the imagery to hook them. I don't think that they're thinking, oh, He's saying he doesn't know something, mm -hmm. you know, and they would be thinking about how much he he's a man and how much he's God and all that. I think that the cults and the church have just really kind of missed it on, on that passage. And 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 you're writing in Matthew 23, he says, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yep. He already knew that he was going to come during one of their feasts. <clears throat> I mean, 
So uh, let me, so as we started this study, one of the things that we talked about was the analogy of faith, or like you mentioned today, going back and looking at scripture, letting scripture interpret scripture. Is there any mention in scripture that just defined it the way that you did, Travis? Like, for example, um, is there other than like maybe perhaps uh, the, the bridegroom, the, the way that Jesus tells stories, is that where you would locate that idea from? Like, where did we get that information of how a wedding ha was handled uh, in the ancient Israel? Externally. I don't I don't know of any passages that would directly lay that out. Matthew, right. Matthew's gospel is pretty clear um, that Joseph and Mary, he was going to divorce her. Well, they yes. were betrothed. Right. right. So there was only a certificate. You could only write you could write a certificate of divorce during the betrothal period. That's mm -hmm. how serious that first year of a covenant was. And and this is a Jewish audience. I mean, in in Matthew 25, uh, verse 12, he says, but he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you watch, therefore, for, you know, neither the day nor the hour. Now, that's right after the parable mm -hmm. of of the wedding. Right. And to be yeah. ready. So that day and hour is exegetically connected to Matthew 24, 36 about the day and the hour. It also he, seems that the parable of the 10 virgins is really kind of showing us um, that that setup where the bridegroom is mm -hmm. going to be coming and they, they needed to trim their lamps. They didn't have the oil. They weren't ready. They, did, they didn't know when he was going to come, but they weren't ready for when he did. So that so I could see that he's constantly Jesus is constantly using that kind of language in his teaching. Well, that's what I was going to say, too, is, you know, I, I can't show you those exact words laid out in a wedding ceremony somewhere or right. even with with the Feast of Trumpets. But what I can show you is Feast of Trumpets and wedding imagery all over both the Old and New Testament. And actually both are found in the Olivet Discourse. So in Matthew 24, 31, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Mm -hmm. There's your trumpets language. And then yep. he goes into that saying, you know, no man knows day or the hour, only my father. And then right after that, you've got a parable about a wedding. So mm -hmm. that line is sandwiched between trumpets and a wedding. Yes. <laughs> Just saying. And well, Paul I agree. Says, I, yeah, that's Paul this said is good. That he's betrothed the church to Christ. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so in Jewish weddings, you could have up to one or two best men. Mm -hmm. And the best men are John the Baptist, uh, the friend of the bridegroom, and Paul. And they and they have espoused the church to Christ. And so during that transition period, that's the betrothal period. Mm -hmm. And we have to follow a historical hermeneutic. So whenever we're exegeting passages, we exegete them based upon their historical situation. Between all that, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, Travis's point is is solid. You know, one other thing I would point out too, um, with that whole view that maybe in Revelation one we're seeing. You know, maybe Jesus didn't know that. And then now he does. You know, maybe that's been revealed to him. You yeah. know, Jesus told him uh, it's John 14 or 16, somewhere in there. But basically, when he goes away, he's going to send the paraclete and he's going to guide them in all truth. Well, mm -hmm. I think when the when the Holy Spirit came, when they received the Holy Spirit, that was the, that was him guiding them in all truth. And that's why we're able to see all the New Testament eminence, because they knew because they were being carried along by the spirit, they knew that these events were about to happen. So did John it, say it is the last hour. Yeah. He so did. it didn't make any sense for me to say all the apostles knew this all throughout those 40 years, but Jesus found out at the end of it and then he gave it to John. You know, I, I don't think that would jive. I think That's there's awesome. a mate. If the futurists were right about like this generation, and I think there would be a major, a major disconnect with all the eminence later in the new testament versus what you see in the gospels so you, you're seeing all the generalizations of this generation and all this and then you switch to all this other stuff why because all those things that jesus knew that he predicted they had already seen them when you see this then know he's at the door well you get to james the judge is standing at the door therefore they'd already seen all this stuff mm -hmm. so back to what travis said a while ago on the as far as the trumpet language with the wedding even right there in the Olivet Discourse in that section, it says that they'll be gathered at the trumpet. Well, that's your mm -hmm. same idea as your, that's your wedding motif. That's John 14, uh, which gives you the same idea. I go to prepare a place for you, and there's all of your parable stuff again. So that's you're right back at 25 it. too, when, when death is swallowed up, you have the marriage. Yep. That's mm -hmm. at the eschatological gathering. 
Yep. So, so what you're telling me is that reading these verses at face value is a dangerous thing to do and that you've really got to take the whole of the New Testament and the whole of the Old Testament, really, to understand the totality of what's being said here. This revelation, what I put in my notes was something else that someone else had said to me. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 says, Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. And when I put that in my notes, the reason that that was being utilized was because it was showing the distinction between the Father and the Son at some moment in time where the Son is handing something to the Father mm -hmm. and then God the Father rules over all, right? So that it's there are these times when we're reading where it seems like there are these distinctions between yep. them. Do you see what I mean? So I think that's that's where that was coming from. And so I appreciate that. Showing the wedding, show it, bringing up the trumpets, showing how that's dialed mm -hmm. in. I'm good. That's totally good for me. I appreciate that. Well, so, and this is ahead. one of those things, too, just real quick, that Unitarians and, and cults and so forth will try to use that and say, see, Jesus mm -hmm. isn't God. You know, God had to give him this. And well, OK, all you got to do is keep reading. Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. He's quoting Isaiah 44, which is about Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus is not God, he's a blasphemer in the first 10 verses of this book. Right. So that's uh, it's ludicrous. Yeah. Very all, all he's all he's saying is I'm the son. And yep. he's using the wedding terminology to, to make that distinction that you're talking about, Rick. Mm -hmm. We have the father and we have the son and we have something that's a, that's about to happen. It's going to be the wedding. But the father alone has the authority to reveal that time. I don't think it's necessarily a proof text that Jesus didn't know it, but yeah, very good. So within that same verse, the things which is, which God gave him to show his bond servants, the things which must soon take place. And like you said, um, pretty much for the most of my life, that was, that was being symbolic, seen as symbolic, but to me, what, what I put in my notes here is that the very beginning, this opening of Revelation is not the apocalyptic vision that's coming in this book, it, in this prophecy. This is just like an opening statement right out of the gate that John is giving, you know, to his to the churches. It's a this is a liturgical type thing because we know because he's going to bless for those who read and hear the words of this prophecy. So it's it's definitely something that needs to be happening in a congregation. And it's to the bond servants, which are the actual ones that are in this tribulation at this moment. So when I see soon, I don't see how that word could be interpreted any other way than the way that it, it's meant. And that word in the Greek is tacos. And it means shortly, speedily, quickly. Like for your language, Mike, the stuff that you were showing, that's in a that's in a in the apocalyptic language itself. I don't see these first three verses as apocalyptic at all. He's just opening a statement about the apocalypse that's coming, right? Yeah. But it's definitely connected to verse seven, which we'll okay. eventually get to, right? Him yes. coming upon the clouds and, and all the mm -hmm. tribes of the land seeing him and so it's it's inseparably connected to the rest of the prophecy that is apocalyptic language. Um, so, yes. and, and that Greek word is not nowhere else in the New Testament are you going to find, hey, when something happens, then it's going to happen really quickly. Like it's it's an event that, you know, chronologically was going to be fulfilled soon. And, you know, the classic example, uh, Zach, maybe you want to cover it. Um, is like uh, if I called the fire department and I said my house is on fire and and they say, hey, look, we're coming. We're coming quickly. And, you know, two days later, they come after the house is burned down and they're like, oh, we're here. We're here. We're here to put out the fire. And we're like, you said you were coming quickly, dude. I mean, it's gone. Oh, what we meant is when we decided we had come, it, we're going to drive that truck really fast. Yeah. And it's just not used that way anywhere in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And yet this is just but yet another example. Last time we talked about different views that try and negate imminence. This is one of those other ones. When it happens, it's going to happen real fast. So, Rick, you're, the point you're making here is that 
kind of like Mike was talking about, when we see these timing words in the Old Testament, like soon and, and at hand and so forth, there's nothing we need to know about that other than that's just rigid, literal, plain language. Mm -hmm. Right. There, he's saying it's going to happen soon. And then, Mike, to your point, when we get to verse seven, now we're back to looking at apocalyptic imagery. Yes. And there's no there's no conflict there in understanding that. Right. Yeah. Because, and the reason I thought that way is because John is labeling himself a bond servant. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be communicated. It says uh, and he sent and signified it by his angel uh, to his bond servant or communicated it to his bond, his angel to his bond servant, John. So this, it, he signified it by his angel to his bondservant, John, and it's for the bondservants. To me, that's straight up language for bondservant to bondservant. Mm -hmm. It's it's not apocalyptic yet. It's going to it's gonna be. But as it stands at the very beginning, as soon as this book opens, it is going to shortly, quickly, speedily take place. Can I make a comment on the bondservants just to throw in a text here? No, I don't sure. want it. Get us. Uh, no, no, I'm you sorry, can't. Zach, no, <laughs> you talk way ahead, too much. Um, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. I think there's a massive misunderstanding of that text. When I read all these passages, like Paul calling himself a do loss or a bond servant, and I read that he's revealing this to bond servants and stuff as well, that's the whole picture of me. Because you think about Galatians, why are you entangling yourself again to a yoke of bondage? When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Like I hear Doug Wilson and them say that that means he led them out of Hades or Sheol at the ascension or whatever. And I'm like, this is second Exodus motif again, that they were they were captives as slaves, just like in the Exodus. Now they're slaves to Christ. And that's the captivity captive. And when I read bond servants, that's exactly where my mind goes to that stuff. Because when you go read where he's quoting that from in Ephesians, it's all about uh, the messianic reign. So just Doesn't not to say in, in Romans five or six, you, you can either be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. You think that's the same point? I do, but everybody accuses me of thinking too much covenant in places. So <laughs> oh boy, that's funny. So let's bring up a topic that I know might ruffle some feathers, but I just I want to bring this up because it's right out of the gate. He sent and signified it by his angel. <laughs> I see Zach. I, I want I want y'all's opinion on this. So y'all interpret this for me. When it says he sent, all right, who is the he? Is it God the Father? And signified it by his angel. Because Travis read Hebrews 1 earlier. And if I if you ask anybody, you say, all right, well, how is the old covenant revealed? Well, it was through angels. So how is the new covenant revealed in the New Testament? Well, he spoke in the last days through his son. All of a sudden you get to the book of Revelation and he's going back to angels. Why is that? James Jordan says that commentators are perplexed and can't figure out why he's doing that. And then I read this and, and it says right here that God gave it to him, that God, that the father gave it to the son to show the servants. And then in the very next end of that verse, he says, he, and I take that to be the father, sent and signified it by his angel, uh, his messenger, Angelos, to his servant, John. Why is that any different than what's said at the very beginning? And when you bring in Malachi chapter 3, which calls Jesus the messenger, the angelos of the covenant, then I think you kind of solve that whole question as to, well, maybe it wasn't through angels. But then you got to figure out something with the rest of the book and some other angel stuff that are in here. So, yeah, this this isn't this isn't where I would plant my flag on that battle at all. Yeah. But, but I do see literal, <laughs> literal literal angels, angelic <laughs> beings in, in Revelation, just as I see them in Daniel. And if we look at verse three, it's about the appointed time that was near. And Daniel is all about the appointed time. And he's constantly getting clarification from angels in Daniel. And so I, I see a, a lot of parallels there between angels helping him understand and revealing revealing this and in the book of revelation the same appointed time except it's near and maybe not here but definitely elsewhere but as we get into these chapters we can I for, ever, for everybody watching rick's trying to pit me and mike against each other right off i'm not bat. i'm not i'm not i'm honestly i'm honestly not but i wanted to i wanted to correct you on something zach in regard to your use of english and that is about where <laughs> 
No, no, no smile. You just want to... <laughs> no. But when he when he says which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel. To me, that's not representing God. That's representing Jesus Christ. Okay. So you son. think it's that's Jesus? So and the he there at the end is Christ, and yes. he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Well, the reason why is because if you say it, you're double saying the word. Look what he did, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So God gave it to Christ. Christ gave it to the angel, which then gave it to John. Now, exactly. this angel, this messenger, whatever you want to call, whatever he is at this point, is this, the, and Mike, maybe you can answer this, is this the same angel that's going to stay with John for the rest of the vision throughout Revelation? Or does it change from angel to angel to angel? I don't know. Ask me when we get there. <laughs> that's good. My <laughs> thought, one of the things that I thought about- You're talking about this. you're talking about the angel that says, don't worship me? That's right. Right. So it's not- That's Christ. why I bring it up. If it's the right. same angel it's throughout, good. then you can't, and he doesn't accept worship, it's not Christ. Yeah, but it could be di it could be different human messengers because you're fixing to see here in chapter one where he's going to apply what most people assume, even the futurists that are the pastors, the angelos, the messengers to those churches. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean it's always Christ. No, right. but that, but then you get back into the is it a spiritual being or is it a human messenger idea? Right. So I think as we go along, maybe we'll start. You know, just keep that in the back of our mind, and then see if it kind of comes up, and we'll get some clarity together. You know. Of course, we don't all have to agree perfectly all of the time, uh, but I had brought up in my notes that I saw this as a timeless being, as a being that kind of like uh, Gabriel in uh, Gabriel in Daniel chapter nine, uh, verse uh, 21. It says, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel and it uses then the man Gabriel. Uh, whom I had seen in the vision previously came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. So if we fast forward to the New Testament in Luke chapter one, verse 18, it says, Zachariah said to the angel, how will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. I'm you. I'm seeing Gabriel. It's not two different Gabriels. I see him as a timeless being separated by almost 500 years. That's and so signified by his angel. I feel like it's one of those ones that are standing in the presence of God that then go to share this information like he did to Daniel talking about the appointed times. It's the same thing that's going on right here um, with this angel going to speak with John. That's that's kind of the way that I was seeing that. But. Then again, like I said, we can go on and on and on. We only have about, you know, six or seven minutes left of this episode. So I thought that I would just ask you guys, um, do you want to have any closing thoughts? And we can pick up uh, next week getting, you know, finishing up maybe verse three and then getting into him, uh, the letters to the churches. Any closing thoughts? I got nothing, Rick. I don't know. I'm racking my brain right now. I've, I've talked too much as it is. I'm going to let these guys go. If I not, want Mike's I'll, take I'll... on why he thinks they're. So if you just asked the question and said, why do you think they're blessed for reading this? You know, why? So let, yeah, let's just go Rick, ahead and tackle Rick, verse three. said we're going to do verse three next week. Well, oh, let's go okay. ahead and do it. We got verse, seven minutes. Uh, let's do it. Verse three needs to be unpacked. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's the appointed time. It really does need to be unpacked. So, yeah. let, all right, then let me review the other part, just so I can think about my angel's thoughts while I ponder this week. So, <laughs> y'all y'all agree with Rick that the he that sent and signified it, his angel to his servant John, is Christ. So, the father gave it to the son. He, the son, sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. And everybody's thinking that we're in angelic being tones there. Is that right? Uh, That's it, what I say. Okay. I, I tend to lean that way just because of what I see in Daniel. Okay. Travis, you okay. got any dog in this fight? In in verse two, who is the who that bore witness? Is that John or is it the angel? John. That's John. Okay. So we're following a progression here is what that's you're right. saying. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's how I see it. And that's just reading English. And a lot of times I wonder um, if I could go back and look at it in the Greek. <laughs> 
you know, and not know how to read Greek, how well I would do with that, which would be terrible. So I'm reading it in English. <laughs> I, I feel like there's this progression of the way that these things are being laid out. And that John, if you remember, uh, I saw it when he says who saw it and bear witness. What it did was it kind of reminded me of something that it says in the gospel of John towards the end of it. Right. Who's, uh, let's see. Let me pull that up real quick. Yeah, that um, would be John because he says he ends that sentence by what he saw. So John yeah. is having the vision and he's bearing witness to what he's being given as well. Right. I and know. I saw it and, and it signed. It kind of sounds like John chapter 21, verse 24. Uh, at the end of John, we says this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and who wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. It's it sounds similar. It doesn't mean that it is, but it just it kind of sounds the way about the word of his testimony. Yeah. Right. So that's why I feel like it's John who is uh, bearing witness to that. In terms of what John's seeing, are y'all thinking that he saw the signs or he saw the actual events and wrote it? And so how, how do you take that? I would see I would see he seen the same things that Daniel saw. OK. And and their their visions. And he's get he's given explanation through an angelic being, probably the same one, Gabriel, that that Daniel received understanding from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was almost curious if it was Daniel that was giving him this information. It doesn't say it, but it kind of feels like a Gabriel esque kind of a feel there that that's the same kind of a, the character role. It's the one that brings this information about the appointed times that God has laid out to yeah, he's, he's told to seal up the vision of the prophecy because the appointed time is far off for him. And then it would make sense that it would be the same angel, whoever you think it is, that'd be Gabriel. Um, he, he tells John to not seal it up because the appointed time is near. Um, but I mean, I could be wrong about that. I mean, it, this is not a, you know, end of the end of the world uh, interpretation either way, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, that was a pun if I've ever heard yeah, one. There you go. <laughs> do we all do we all agree that John saw more than Daniel because knowledge had increased? Is that fair? Yeah, because he, he not only had angels, angelic uh, interpretation and visions, but he had the teaching right. of Jesus yeah. in the Olivet Discourse. I mean, he had all of that. So he had, yeah, knowledge increased, Daniel 12, 4 for sure. Yeah, and that's why I want to say um, as we close this is that slowing down and talking these things out, it's critical. Like it, it means a lot to me uh, what Travis said in regard to the wedding uh, in regard to trumpet language, these are things that I may not have picked up on or maybe others had not picked up on. And that's what I'm hoping that we're all going to get in this study. We've read a lot. We've we've studied a lot. Let's let's utilize that information and bring out as much as we possibly can. Uh, breaking down verse by verse exegesis in, is so important and so critical. And um, Zach, just the fact that the things that you are seeing um I mean, I think it's valid and I think it needs we just need to keep that kind of those kind of things in our mind as we go through this, you know, and I'm just going to come right out and say to everyone who's listening right out of the gate. I have no clue. I, I really don't have everything together, but I certainly want to learn as much as possible. And I hope that you too, you do, too. Yeah, I would I would just throw that out there, too, because I know a lot of people that's probably not a familiar thought with the whole trumpets and wedding thing research this don't don't just believe it because you saw me say it on a youtube video like go mm -hmm. do your homework and listen if you find something that contradicts that let me know because i you know i care more about the truth than being right so i, I heard that view back in 1991 um a reformed baptist pastor tom lyons he he preached that way and he wasn't even a preterist dude i, I think he was a partial preterist but he took that angle on that. And I was like, that makes the most sense I've ever heard. It's it's not dealing with omniscience per se mm -hmm. or deity or anything. It's a, it's an exegetical um, hermeneutical hook to hook them into a concept of wedding trumpets. It's not, you shouldn't be literalizing it. Yeah, absolutely. So for the folks listening and watching this, uh, you, you're, you are a part uh, of a, a very intense study here. So do some do some homework on verse three. We're going to be getting into, we're going to probably wrap up. Um, yeah. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein 
but the time is at hand. We're going to get, we'll be back next week and we are going to unpack that. What you got, well, Mike? The homework is that Greek word for time, kairos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show us where it's used in the Old Testament, specifically in Daniel, in the Septuagint, and how Paul uses it, how Peter uses it, and how Jesus uses it, because it is really key. And how it's used elsewhere in Revelation, because there's only one appointed time. There's not two. That's right. So look, what's that? I said gentry. Oh, <laughs> So yeah. look up Kairos, look at uh, verse three and do some homework and get ready. So, all right, guys, thanks for your time this week. I really appreciate it. And Joel, I hope you feel better, buddy. And we'll see you next week, too. Man. And Zach, stop talking so much. You talked way too much in this. Jeez, episode. man. I, I I went at it hard today in the sermon. We're <laughs> recording this, guys, right after, uh, pretty much right after I stepped out of the pulpit. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. Just all right, guys. We'll see you next week. All right. <laughs> Take care, guys. Peace out.